peace, peace. It is your girl, Morgan Renee Myers, tuning in for another story time with more of mine. We are in the book, A Medical Apartheid, today, the dark history of medical experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to present by Harriet A. Washington. I already read the intro in two parts. Um, you can find it on my YouTube if you're not subscribed, go to that channel. Um, it's my name, Morgan Myers, but you can also look up Storytime with Moremy, M-O-R-E-M-Y, which is the abbreviation of my initials, Morgan A. Myers, okay? So, now we're in part one, chapter one, um, and let's get right into it, a troubling tradition. This may be a triggering um, read or listen, because we are talking about the dark history of medical experimentation on black Americans, and just from the intro, the author was pointing out why she felt it oh well my head wrap come loose why she felt the necessity to write this book because there were things that have been going down um to black people in the medical field and she was like a medical student and uh, then became a journalist and there was just so much uh going on that wasn't chronicled in the way that she's going to chronicle it um black people being used to test studies or treated as if we don't feel pain. She mentioned J. Marion Sims, who's the father of, uh, godfather of, uh, uh, what is it, <laughs> medicine in the sense of uh, gynecological medicine. And really, um, black people's bodies have just been ways to be um, tested on. Not cool. So let's get into what Harriet has to say. Part 1, A Troubling Tradition, Chapter 1, Southern Discomfort, Medical Exploitation on the Plantation. Celia's child was about four months old, died last Saturday the 12th. This is two Negroes and three horses I have lost this year. David Gavin, 1855. Frederick Gard... 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 <laughs> I've been getting tripped up sometimes. It's G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R. -E so I don't know if it's Gardner or Gardiner, Frederick Gardner, a peripatetic Mormon physician, left among his travel memoirs an impression of the 19th century slave markets of Washington, D.C. There are a great number of Negroes, nearly all of whom are slaves, and on different streets are large halls occupy as marts or stores for the sale or purchase of slaves. While I have been looking at one of these places on Revere Street, Two gentlemen have arrived, one of whom I have seen in the saloon. He is a young planter and comes to purchase a girl to take care of his children or whatever duties he may think proper to impose upon her. The other person is a doctor whom he has brought with him for the purpose of examining her. They pass along the front of the row in company of the agent or salesman. As they move forward, one is called upon to stand up, then another, while a passive examination is made. Then finally, he discovers a bright mulatto who appears about 16 years of age and is quite good looking. She is ushered into a private room where she is stripped to a nude condition and a careful examination is made of all parts of the body by the doctor and is pronounced by him to be found. The money is then paid and she is transferred to her new owner. I have heard that the masters beat and scars them cruelly, but I have not seen anything of the kind, nor do I believe that it occurs very often. For the southern people as a class are noble-minded, kind-hearted people and can be found in any country. And moreover, it will be against their own interest to brutally treat their slaves, as no planter desire to have sick Negroes on his hands. According to my judgment so far as my experience extends, I believe that the Negroes as a class are far more humanly treated and taken care of than are the laboring classes of European countries. Boo! Enslavement could not have existed and certainly could not have persisted without medical science. However, physicians were also dependent upon slavery, both for economic security and for the enslaved clinical material that fed the American medical research and medical training that bolstered physicians' professional advancement. Gardner's vignette suggests that integral role of medicine in enslavement and repeats the key belief that slave owners and physicians shared an interest in preserving the slave's health as no planter desired to have sick Negroes on his hands. But although medicine was essential to enslavement, the apparent solicitude for the health of slaves was not all it seemed. Rather, the medical interests of the slave were often diametrically opposed to the interests of the owner and of American physicians. From the first 
antagonism reigned between African Americans and their physicians. Between the 17th century advent of African settlers to North America and the end of the 19th century, the slave and the physician shared an unrecognizably primitive medical world. The germ theory that revealed the microbial nature of much disease and led to the first grand waves of disease cures was still well in the future. The existence of pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and fungi was unsuspected. Almost no effective treatments existed for prevalent diseases into the 18th century. Until the late 1830s, the lack of effective anesthesia made the few common surgical procedures horribly painful and all others impossible. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, medicine in the United States reflected a narrowly limited understanding of disease and a rather cursory training of medical practitioners. Public health institutions were few, feeble, and ephemeral, rising momentarily with epidemics of yellow fever or smallpox and subsiding from neglect after the crisis resolved. Even the simplest public health measures, hand washing and antiseptic techniques, clean water, sound, pathogen free housing and, un and untainted food supplies, sewage management, and quantitative disease reporting were all in the future. Because there were only a few effective disease therapies and no antibiotics, epidemics of yellow fever, malaria, tuberculosis, and other infectious diseases frequently raged unchecked. In the early 1700s, this mirrored the situation in England and the rest of Europe. But medicine on the continent began to undergo modernizing changes, although these were very slow. Um, although these were very slow to cross the Atlantic. Europe began to embrace public health measures and medical advances such as widespread vaccination, scientific medical education, and the rise of the hospital, but American progress lagged behind, especially in the insular South. The point of this chapter is on flattering precedes of nascent American medicine is not to castigate it for its primitivism, but to put Blacks' historical aversion to medical care into context, for most antebellum Blacks were subjected to Southern medicine. The South was a particularly unhealthy region and was home to 90% of, of American blacks, the majority of whom were enslaved until 1865. The first blacks arrived in colonies in 1619, and by 1700, there were only about 200,000 blacks. But as the slave trade flourished, 200,000 more blacks arrived each year, although 30% of transported slaves died in the nightmare of the Middle Passage. There were 550,000 chattel slaves in the United States by 1776, when blacks constituted 20% of the U.S. population. By 1807, slave importation was illegally prohibited throughout the country, and by 1860, the nation's 4 million enslaved blacks had a value equivalent to $4 billion today. In some states, the black population completely comprised slaves. Alabama, for example, forbade the presence of free blacks. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I gotta take a watermelon sour stop pineapple juice drink. Sip on that. Goodness gracious. This country. Mm -mm -mm. Crazy. The South was the nadir of the American medical experience, visited by a deadly triple confluence the pathogens of North America, Europe, and Africa. This unholy trinity yielded a bewildering array, array of unfamiliar infectious diseases such as hookworms, types of malaria, and yellow fever, incubated by a subtropical climate that was hospitable year-round to pathogens that could not thrive in the colder north. Even familiar European illnesses flared anew in strangely virulent forms, abetted by the hot, marshy climate, poor sanitation, and public health vacuums. Although the South harbored a visibly Oh, excuse me. Although the South harbored a highly visible affluent class, the region's relative poverty led to a death of medical care and a host of unrecognized nutritional deficiency diseases. So did enslavement. A dramatically misunderstood set of disease etiologies led to the adoption of heroic remedies calculated to kill or cure. Through the 18th century, Western medicine was not only misinformed, but dangerously so. Caustic medicines of the period often contain metabolic poisons such as arsenic or calomel, a compound of mercury and chlorine that was used as a purgative. Many other remedies contain highly toxic substances such as mercury and addictive Schedule II narcotics, including the opiates, laudanum, opium, and morphine, as well as cocaine derivatives. 
these medicines addicted, sickened, and killed outright. They could also trigger chemical uh, pneumonitis or progressive lung injury if inhaled during a bout of iatrogenic or physician-triggered vomiting. No study seems to have been done on this point, but such lung injuries may have helped to account for slaves' higher death rate from respiratory disease. Mm. Induced vomiting was an everyday event because the common denominator of medical techniques in this period was the violent release of bodily fluids. Copious bleeding, blistering, and the induction of violent diarrhea were standard therapies. Harsh laxatives or draught, such as calomel or JLAP, produced copious diarrhea, which leached nutrients, water, and electrolytes from the body. They also invited painful bed sores, which were open to infection unchallenged by antibiotics. These crude therapies were not only unpleasant, but debilitating to ill persons and even to the strong and healthy. Arsenic, for example, produced not only the intended vomiting and diarrhea, but also a wide range of other problems, including fainting, heart disease, disorders of the nervous system, gangrene, and cancers. Mercury's very serious effects included injury to the nervous system, profound mental deficits, hair and tooth loss, kidney and heart disease, a lung injury, and respiratory distress. Mercury crossed the placental barrier and concentrated in breast milk, contributing to the high black infant death rate and birth defect rate. Since ministrations were often fatal, oh, such ministrations were often fatal. The 1799 death of George Washington happened by a copious bloodletting that the debilitated former president could ill afford is perhaps the best known example of a patient finished off by the misguided heroics of 18th century medicine. I don't know how George Washington died. I'm not sure to that. However, whites of the slave-owning class enjoyed better initial health, better nutrition, and less exposure to environmental pathogens and parasites than did enslaved blacks. Slave owners did not suffer from overwork and exposure, so they were better able to they were better able than slaves to withstand the rigors of bloodletting. Sensing this, many physicians and scientists discouraged bloodletting for slaves. Thomas Jefferson, statesman and amateur physician scientist, wrote unequivocally, never bleed a Negro. But in their everyday practices, physicians didn't listen. Dr. Lunsford Yandale wrote on March 16, 1833, I was called before sunrise to visit a Negro woman. I took from her 12 ounces of blood. I waited about 15 minutes when she had a severe convulsion. Such techniques as cupping, the use of heated glass jars to create a partial vacuum that drew blood upwards to the skin surface or through an incision in the skin, and trepanation, the therapeutic drilling of holes in the skull, were risky for pampered, well-nourished adults living in relatively healthy environments, but they were fatal attentions for sickly, undernourished, and exhausted slaves and for their children, who were at even higher risk of succumbing to anemia or dehydration. Enslaved African Americans were more vulnerable than whites to respiratory infections thanks to poorly constructed slave shacks that emitted winter cold and summer heat. Slaves' immune systems were unfamiliar with or naive to microbes that caused various pneumonias and tuberculosis. Parasitic infections and abysmal nutrition also undermine black immunological rigor. Before antibiotics and sterile techniques, surgery was an often fatal affair. Unaware of the connection between bacteria and infection, surgeons operated in their street clothes or with dirty hands and filthy environments, such as the shacks that served as slave hospitals. Even minor incisions or injuries could proceed to life-threatening infections with frightening rapidity. Southern medicine of the 18th and early 19th centuries was harsh, ineffective, and experimental by nature. Physicians' memoirs, medical journals, and planters' records all reveal that enslaved black Americans bore the worst abuses of these cruelly empirical practices, which counter which um, countenance a hazardous degree of ad hoc experimentation in medications, dosages, and even spontaneous surgical experiments in the daily practice among slaves. Physicians were active participants in the exploitation of African American bodies. The records reveal that slaves were both medically neglected and abused because they were powerless and legally invisible. The courts were almost completely uninterested in the safety and health rights of the enslaved. The practice of hiring slaves out further endangered enslaved workers by removing much of an employer's incentives to keep the slaves healthy and safe. Some humane plantation owners were careful to choose less risky work venues, but a great danger of slave death or disability was inherent in some forms of mining, tobacco production, rice farming, and most plantation work. In these settings, 
The slave's possible death became part of the owner's commercial calculations. Ominously for blacks, the owners, not the enslaved workers, determined safety and rational medical care, deciding when and what type of care was to be given. Because professional attention was expensive, most owners dosed their own slaves as long as they could before calling in physicians, who usually saw slaves only in extremis as a last resort. In clinical notes, medical journeys and memo- journals and memoirs, physicians consistently decried the planter's tendency to rely upon the cheaper administrations of overseers, slaves, and mistresses in order to save expense. Physicians' records also expressed disgust at the conditions in which enslaved workers were kept. Historian Richard Shyrock observed in 1936, Of all critics, the Southern physician was perhaps in the best position to report on the physical and moral treatment of the slaves. When he stated, as he sometimes did, that Negroes were overworked and underfed, he can hardly be suspected of anti-slavery bias since he was the friend of the planter who employed him. As a matter of fact, he usually approved of the institution. Planter's own records and slave narratives corroborate physicians' complaints that planters provided professional medical care only when they deemed it necessary to save the slave's life, often too late. Owners also restricted access to medical care by routinely accusing sick blacks of malingering. Slave narratives and planters' records reveal that an owner faced with a sick slave was likely to believe the illness of Spain. In her excellent and nuanced history, Working Cures, Healing Health, and Power on Southern Slave Plantations, Charlotte Fett describes how in 1859, slave owner William Macy resentfully reported that his 80-year-old Patty had just died of I know not what disease. She had been saying she was sick for near a year and was always pre- and always pretended to be sick. No doctor was ever summoned to in de- investigate, and not even Patty's death seems to have exonerated her from charges of malingering. The enfeebled Patty was no longer valuable in the fields or as a breeder, so the nature of her sickness was inconsequential. Mm. Mm-mm. Owners relied upon doctors to tell them whether slaves were malingering, but physicians were less than objective. Dr. W. H. Taylor called in consultation for an enslaved man, prefaced his assessment with the phrase, remembering that simulation was a characteristic of his race. Doctors and owners wrote articles in which they shared medical ruses and techniques calculated to get blacks healthier or not back into the field. Dr. M. L. McLeod even wrote his master's thesis on the fraudulent illness of slaves. Wow. He shared an incident in which he had accidentally administered an overdose of ammonium carb- carbonate, a corrosive white powder that was often used as smelling salts to a slave, shamming in an epileptic fit. The burning sensation shocked her into abandoning her performance, and McLeod, like many other doctors, began to advocate such veiled medical violence when confronted with questionable illness in slaves. The masters also responded to suspected malingering or prolonged illness with frank abuse. Thomas Chaplin wrote in his planter's journal, Mary came out of the sick house today and rather was whipped out, or rather was whipped out. Oh, Lord Jesus. Owners and physicians also blurred the therapeutic line by referring jocularly to whipping as medicine for malingering slaves. One complaining woman was treated with a cow skin or hickory switch to scourge her emphasis at it. Other doctors recommended that an owner apply nine drops of essence of rawhide or oil of hickory to the back of a sick slave. Yet slave narratives occasionally speak of the kindness of a sympathetic white physician. In the 1930s, former Texas slave Wes Brandy told WPA interviewers how the old white doctor that tended to help us get that the old white doctor that tended to us helped them get out of work. He took a little flour and meal and water and made pills. The doctor then told the master that the slave was too sick to work. Sometimes they stayed in bed three or four days taking flour pills. But most physicians share the economic and political interests of slave owners and conspire with the planters, their real clients, to subjugate slaves by invading their bodies. Former slave Martha Griffiths Brown recalled that the kindly wife of Dr. Manley, who sometimes was called in by her master, did not believe in slavery, yet she dared not speak against the peculiar institution of the South. It would injure the doctor's practice and a matter about which she must be careful. 
The belief in the eternal malingering of slaves was only one tenet of scientific racism, a wide body of mostly unflattering beliefs about the bodies and minds of people of African descent. These beliefs were presented as, such, as research findings, explained by scientific theories, and prom, um, promulgated uh, by whites who were sympathetic to or were actively profiting from the institution of the slavery. So, not surprisingly, scientific racism provided medical and scientific justifications for slavery. Southern scientists claim that they alone could analyze blacks with authority. After all, they lived in proximity to blacks, had studied them, and understood their medical and intellectual characteristics. Northern scientists tended not to study African Americans because they were less important to the northern economy, which was not directly based upon chattel slavery. Mm, okay, so let's, uh, that kind of makes sense. So in the South, where slavery is a big deal, that's why all of this heinous, uh, heinous crimes would be going on. But in the North, chattel slavery, they were dependent on that, so... They didn't have to go out their way to, like, harm blacks by doing medical research. Okay. Let me read that again. The belief in the eternal malingering of slaves was only one tenet of scientific racism, a wide body of mostly unflattering beliefs about the bodies and minds of people of African descent. These beliefs were presented as research findings, explained by scientific theories, and promulgated by whites who were sympathetic to or actively profiting from the institution of slavery. So... Not surprisingly, scientific racism provided medical and scientific justifications for slavery. Southern scientists claimed that they alone could analyze blacks with authority. After all, they lived in proximity to blacks, had studied them, and understood their medical and intellectual characteristics. Northern scientists tended not to study African Americans because they were less important to the northern economy, which was not directly based upon chattel slavery. Mm, mm, mm. The care and treatment of slaves was an important aspect of Southern medical regionalism, and the lack of attention to Negro medicine became an increasingly bitter source of contention between Northern and Southern medical schools. As a result, Southerners urged their medical students to eschew the schools of the North, and when tensions mounted on the eve of the Civil War, Southern students of Northern medical schools were holding rallies in which they voted to return South in mass. In Philadelphia alone, 200 Southern medical students withdrew from Jefferson College and another 100 withdrew from the University of Pennsylvania during a single academic year. Let me go back. I feel like I missed something. The care and treatment of slaves was an important aspect of Southern medical regionalism and the lack of attention to Negro medicine became an increasingly bitter source of contention between Northern and Southern medical schools. As a result, Southerners urged their medical students to eschew the schools of the North and when tensions mounted on the eve of the Civil War, Southern students of Northern Medical School were holding rallies in which they voted to return South en masse. Okay. In Philadelphia alone, 200 Southern Medical students withdrew from Jefferson College and another 100 withdrew from the University of Pennsylvania during a single academic year, 1859-1860. Despite their claims of unique expertise, the shoddy research that Southern physicians conducted into black health consisted of an untested nucleus of mythology about the biological nature of blacks. Negative visceral reactions to blacks' appearance, historical writings, racial descriptions from antiquity, natural sciences' endless and largely fictional catalogs of racial traits, and biblical interpretations all provided a framework for scientific and medical theories about blacks. So did a blame-the-victim approach to the poor health of the enslaved. The scientific racist's emphasis was not upon fact-based theories, logical methodologies, experimental data, control groups, and verification by replication. There were neither checks against accepting assumptions as facts nor any tests for confounding social factors. There certainly was no provision for removing ethnocentric bias. This science was the embodiment of ethnocentric, was the embodiment of ethno, ethnocentric bias. This science also served a critical political purpose, for it provided a biological and ethical rationale for enslavement. Historical documents reveal that African Americans recognized this hazardous medical agenda and resisted when they could. Thus, medical abuse fed iatrophobia, the fear and loathing many black Americans harbor to this day toward the American medical establishment. 
I have iatrophobia. I used to go to the doctor all the time, especially in college when I was uh, way more sexually active. I would go and get uh, STD testing a lot. And I remember the last time I went, um, I had a, um, I needed a colonoscopy. Um, my pap smear came back irregular, and so they needed to take some extra tests to make sure I didn't have cancer. And so at this time, I hadn't paid my gynecologist bill, so they had removed me from being a patient there. So I had to go through, like, the hospital. And there was some insurance program where it was supposed to make it free. And so anyways, I go to the hospital and to get the, the colonoscopy. And I get in the room, I'm in there over five minutes, at least, if not over five minutes, with the syrup in me. For those that know about OBGYN, they put this, like, duck bill type thingy, they crank it up to open your vagina so they can see it and swab. And they had that in me while they were still looking for whatever they needed to, like, hook up to the TV so they could see what was going on. Very traumatic experience for me. And I've not been back to the doctor since. And just knowing what I know, I just, I just... Yeah, I'm very, very uncomfortable. It's making my skin crawl thinking about it. Makes me want to cry. Um, so I haven't had a pap smear or anything like that since. And I kind of don't want to. I kind of just know I need to eat well and exercise and stay away from them unless it's an emergency. If my damn arm or neck is broke, that's the only time I really want to be in a hospital. I don't even want to give birth in a hospital. So, in exit exegesis of American medical literature compiled in the service of scientific racism is beyond the scope of this book and has been ably completed elsewhere. However, a description of the most pertinent beliefs will help to illuminate the atmosphere in which blacks were medically abused and in which they learned to be wary of the precepts and practices of American medicine. The science of race has always been an amalgam of logic and culture. The nature of race itself is an important but nebulous and shifting facet of scientific medical thought. As early as A.D. 160, the Roman physician Galen, 129 C. described African men as possessing oversized sexual organs and inferior intelligence, but until the 17th century, the changing meaning of race had encompassed only nations and families. Race in the singular also denoted all of mankind as in the race of man. Use of the term race to denote biologically different types of mankind evolved only in the 18th century when the study of animal breeding gave rise to heightened awareness of animal subspecies and of the possibility of breeding animals to encourage desired traits. Not coincidentally, this period con coincided with the growth of the slave trade when the biological distinctiveness of men became economically important. Those who studied the different groups of men were called ethnologists and were the forerunners of anthropologists. Ethno ethnologists applied the classification and categorization methods of the natural sciences called taxonomy to the study of man. Even after the meaning of race came to include subgroupings of man, it had several meanings. By races, races, R A C E S, by races, some meant biological subspecies of man and allogies to the different breeds of dogs. For example, Swedish naturalist Carl von Lien, um, Carolinus Linnaeus, the most famous of the taxonomists, categorized Africans and by extension U.S. blacks as homo affer, theorizing that black men had different evolutionary forebears and had evolved along a separate evolutionary track from white men. In 1735, the first edition of his Systema Nature also designated the subspecies Homo sapiens americanus for Native Americans, whom he described as ruled by superstition. Homo sapiens asiaticus for Asians, whom he believed were ruled by ritual, and Homo sapiens Euro europius for whites who were ruled by intelligence. But in Linnaeus, but in Leno, in Linnaeus's system, Homo sapiens affer were ruled by a caprice. This use of the word race in the sense of a biologically distinct subset of Homo sapiens. Okay, sorry. Uh, the use of this word race in the sense of a biologically distinct subset of Homo sapiens 
was popularized in 1749 by Georges Louis Leclerc, his name, Comte de Buffon, a wealthy French intellectual who made important contributions to medicine and natural history. Buffon notably theorized that the resemblance between apes and humans hinted at a common ancestry. For other theorists, race indicated entirely different species of men with different origins as well as different characteristics for blacks and whites. Those who believed in this theory were the polygenists. Still, others believe that whites and blacks shared a common ancestral ape and a single species. These were the monogenists. Most monogenists believed that whites and blacks were originally and inherently equal, but that blacks had suffered from environmental and social pressures that caused them to become inferior. Other monogenists um, believed that black dev de devolution had imparted permanent inferiority, although they still share a species designation with whites. We are not inferior and never have been. Throughout the 17th century and into the 18th, early 18th century, the theories of scientific racism were informed by the Bible as well as by science. Monogenesis, for example, held that people of every race had originated from the biblical Adam and Eve. Gradually, blacks had taken on divergent characteristics such as darkened skin, woolly hair, and uh, prognathal features dictated by their African climate. The idea that black features were dictated by climate was already widespread. Shakespeare's Cleopatra, for example, is described as burnt black by Phoebus Amorous Kisses. Monogenesis believed that black features were inferior to those of the white man, but they also believed that they were malleable and that blacks could catch up to Caucasians. But in the end, it was scientific beliefs that proved malleable, and by the late 1830s, they bent to accommodate the political reality of abolitionism. White, black, and white abolitionists were turning world and domestic opinion against enslavement as inhumane, unjust, and unchristian. And pro-slavery physician scientists such as Josiah Clark Knott, Samuel George Morton, Louis Ag Agassiz, and George Robbins Gleeden, leaders of the American School of Ethnology, went on the defensive. They responded by portraying the enslaved black as inherently debased and immutably so. No amount of training, education, or good treatment can make him the equal of a white man. According to the polygenesis, blacks were physically inferior and were liars, malingers, hypersexual, and indolent. In the early years of the 18th century, blacks were most often compared to beasts. Later in the century, comparisons to European children reigned instead, children who would never grow up, and the slaves became Peter Pan and blackface. The supposed lack of adult judgment rendered blacks unable to care for themselves and gave yet another ju justification for slavery. It is also important to trace the tangled distinctions between racism and, racial, and racialism. Racists believe in an innate, unusually immutable inferiority, but racialist is a confusing label because it is applied to people holding very different beliefs. The term can denote a person who believes that race or skin color does signal inherent attributes, but that the attributes in question are simply different, neither negative nor inferior. But racialist can also mean a person who interprets the different features and qualities of blacks as superior. The word racialist has been recently has recently been used to describe actions taken to redress long standing racial wrongs, such as affirmative action to bolster the fortunes of blacks. Then again, racialist can also be a mere synonym for racist as it is long as it long was used in England and has been adopted by racial hatred groups as a euphemism for racism. As a result of this semantic confusion, a once useful term has been rendered worthless by its many contradictory meanings. The awkward and pallid term race-based seems the closest thing we now have to a neutral racial adjective. Whatever their pet theory, the many physical differences between blacks and whites suggested a hierarchy of humanity to scientific races. Different from whites meant inferior, and inferiority was documented in an entire catalog of black flaws that filled medical journals and textbooks. In 1839, Morton published Crania Americana, a book written to demonstrate how human skull measurements indicated a hierarchy of racial types. Morton determined that Caucasians had the largest skulls and therefore the largest brains, and blacks the smallest. His tests were the forerunner of phrenology, which sought to determine character and intelligence by interpreting the shape of the skull. By 1848, Louisiana Samuel A. Cartwright, M.D., had gained renown by publishing a plethora of articles on Negro medicine in Southern, 
Southern Medical Journals, leading the Medical Association of Louisiana to appoint him chair of the committee to investigate black health and psychology. Um, physiology, excuse me. Black health and physiology. Uh, that same year, Cartwright published his paper, The Diseases and Physical Peculiarity of the Negro Race. Cartwright augmented his scholarly work with a constant onslaught of medically-based pro-slavery letters to newspapers and popular magazines. He supported his widely read claims of black inferiority with a mixture of biblical lore and scientific theories that were not unusual for, this time, for his time. Cartwright suggested that black physical and mental defects made it impossible for them to survive without white supervision and care, alleging that the cranium of blacks is 10% smaller than that of whites, preventing full development of the brain and causing a stunting of the intellect. French scientist Louis-Pierre Louis Gray Toilette added that in the Negro, the cranium closes on the brain like a prison and is no longer a temple divine, to use the expression of Malpighi, but I don't know what that means, M-A-L-P-I-G-H-I. Um, it is no longer a temple divine to use the expression of mild pig eye, but a sort of helmet for resisting heavy blows. Cartwright even asserted that blacks had a very different breathing apparatus and skeletal structure from that of whites. By 1851, Cartwright had also discovered and described a host of imaginary black diseases whose principal sim symptoms seemed to be a lack of enthusiasm for slavery. Who's enthused about being slaves? Escape might have seemed normal behavior for a slave in ancient Greece or Rome, but Cartwright medically condemned such behavior in American blacks, offering a diagnosis of drapetomania from the Greek word for flight and insanity. Hebitude was a singular laziness or shiftlessness that caused slaves to mishandle and abuse their owner's property. Dys dysthesia Asiopica was another black behavioral malady which was characterized by a desire to destroy the property of white slave owners. Cartwright claimed that it differs from every other species of mental disease as it is accompanied with physical signs or lesions uh, of the body discoverable to the medical observer. Struma africana was a form of tuberculosis that physicians misdiagnosed as a peculiarly African disease. Uh, because Shakespeare Africana referred to black supposed propensity for eating non-food substances such as clay, chalk, and dirt. Actually, this disorder, which is called pika today, is not racially specific, and the cravings it inspires were probably related to the rampant malnutrition among slaves. Tellingly, Dr. Cartwright recommended that these ailments be treated with corporal punishment or with intern internment in work camps. Put the patient to some kind to some hard kind of work in the open air and sunshine. The compulsory power of the white man by making the slothful Negro take active exercise puts into play the lungs, though whose agents through whose agency the vitalized blood is sent to the brain to give liberty to the mind. Other medical disorders were thought to manifest differently, unusually less severely in black. Syphilis, for example, was held to be racially dysmorphic. Physicians believe that work is the most feared damage within the neurological system of whites, but that the less evolved nervous system of the blacks was left relatively unimpaired. In black, syphilis was thought to attack the muscles, including the heart. This believed that syphilis in blacks differed dramatically from the disease in whites, provided a rationale for the infamous U.S. Public Health Service to study study of syphilis in the untreated Negro male. Between 1932 and 1972, 600 black men, their wives, and their children were deceived in participating in a research study that denied them treatment so that PHS scientists could trace the progress of disease in black. 30 years. Wait, 30 to 70. 40 years. Mm -mm -mm. That's crazy. In an 1850 paper, Cartwright insisted that whites and blacks differ so dramatically that the same medical treatment which will benefit or cure a white man so often injure or kill a Negro. This universal, dis this universal belief in uniquely black diseases led doctors and planters to clamor for a textbook on the medical care of blacks, but such a book was not written until almost a century later. When it appeared in 1942, it was no pagan 
to white superiority, but rather an entitled. But in but uh, when it appeared in 1942, it was no paying to white superiority, but rather was entitled "The Biology of the Negro," a text edited by African American physician Julian Herman Lewis. It was followed in 1975 by the Masterwork Textbook of Black Related Diseases by Richard Allen Williams, M.D. Allegedly inferior cognition was only the tip of the iceberg. In 1854, several years after Cartwright published Report on Diseases and Physical Peculiarities of the Negro Race, and five years before Darwin published On the Origin of Species, Mobile, Alabama physician Josiah Knott, M.D. and George R. Gooden produced an equally popular screed entitled Types of Mankind. In it, they claim that black physical and mental differences signal their polygenic origins and prove black inferiority. For example, not theorized that the distinctive knee joint and long heel of the black man proves that he had been created as a submissive knee bender, a servant to white. Scientists adjusted the dark, the dark skin of the Africans as a biblical curse that set them aside as eternal servants to other men. Black Americans were thought of as a race that was biologically identical to the African race, and there originally was some logic to this. Because 20% of slaves were still Native Africans in 1780, although that number dropped to only 10% by 1830, a few decades after slave importation officially stopped. Mulattoes, the progeny of black-white matings, were considered to be a separate race. According to ethnologists of the American school, black speeches marked them as a different species, large buttocks and genitals that indicated hypersexuality, a head covering that was not hair, but analogous to the wool of livestock, the size of the skull determined by painstaking but rigged measurements, the prognathous facial angles of blacks and thick lips that testified to their ape-like nature. Had scientists of the era more correctly noted that apes and chimpanzees have the sentence of lips, they doubtless would have ignored this feature before they credited blacks with such an evolutionary advance. Physicians discovered many imaginary physical differences in blacks, such as fingernail anomalies, a distinctive topography of the breast, elongated penises, disproportionately um, large hands and feet, distended labia and clitoris, all of which provided scientific races with ample evidence of black biological primitivism. In fact, Few anatomical sites escape persistent labeling as definite indicators of black inferiority. As late as 1903, Dr. W.T. English observed a careful inspection reveals the body of the Negro, a mass of imperfection from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet. Even biological advantages were cast as racial flaws. In discussing the tendency of blacks to survive yellow fever epidemic that killed whites, one physician denounced the inferior susceptibility of black slaves. I'm so over them. All right, we're going to stop here um, at Insidious Immunity, still in Chapter 1 of Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to Present. These people are a hot, darn mess, child. Mm -mm -mm. So if you need to get caught up on um, other readings of this or other books that I've read by black authors, make sure you tune into my YouTube, Morgan Myers, or type in Storytime with more of my um, you see a red logo with a yellow M inside. The more my is um, for my initials. My name is Morgan Renee Meyer. So M O R E M Y. So if you're gonna want more of my reading, entertainment, creations, and all of that good stuff. Um, so thank y'all for tuning in, and I will be tuning in with you all again real soon. All right, peace.